and welcome back to Otaku no Video. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Where today I'm digging deeper into Princess Mononoke, the legendary anime film by Hayao Miyazaki. Now, this is a spoilerific video, so if you haven't watched Princess Mononoke and want to remain virginal, don't watch this video. Um, but I want to delve into some of the themes and characters and elements of Princess Mononoke here. Let's start by looking at some of the themes of Mononoke, in particular, the environment. Um, and there's a lot of environmentalism in this film, particularly dealing with man's relationship to nature. Um, there's this question of um, at what point has man turned on nature and at what point has he not. Um, and you see this interesting uh, con contrast between the different civilizations of Princess Mononoke. There is um, um, Ashitaka's village, uh, well, you don't really know much about them, but you do know that, that when this god attacks, they try to appease it, but then Ashitaka fights back. Um, otherwise, they seem pretty well in tune. And then, of course, you see Iron Town. Um, you see other um, more civilized villages around it uh, before that. And again, it gets into this question of... Um, of at what point is, is man despoiling nature? Um, Mononoke is, to a great extent, a reworking of the themes from Nausicaa of the Valley of Wind, uh, the anime and the manga, which are kind of two different things. Anyway, um, one statement that, uh, that Hayao Miyazaki made is that, and I'm going to murder this quote, but it's, um, one cannot have a reasonable um, uh, opinion and approach towards the environment unless you start with the recognition that man, by existing, consumes resources. And I think that's something that he came to between Nausicaa and Mononoke. Uh, more accurately, I think it's something he came to after Nausicaa the movie, and you see more of in the manga that he continued on after that. Um, and Mononoke does seem to recognize this, the fact that um, um, man's relationship to nature is not a simple matter that you can, you can go to some point where you're in perfect balance. Um, balance doesn't really exist in nature. Um, it, it is a convenient um, metaphor for certain processes in nature. But the reality is things are growing, things are dying off, it's, it's, it's complex and chaotic. Um, and in Mononoke, we see this struggle between man and nature, and then nature fighting back against man. Um, and it raises this question of, okay, um, what do you do when you're caught in the situation? What do you do when you realize you've gone too far? Um, you've got to deal with that. It also deals with peace and war, particularly the cost of war. You see how uh, conflict and, and war in general is very destructive. Um, and that it's destructive beyond simply, you know, laying waste to your enemies and seeing them driven before you. They are, uh, war is, is um, almost inevitably gets out of control and almost inevitably is extremely damaging to everyone involved. Um, and so we see those consequences of what war can do um, and those extra effects of war. And a good example of that actually comes earlier in the... Uh, uh, in the movie, something that I didn't realize until I read some of the other stuff about Mononoke. You remember early in the movie, uh, Ashitaka comes across some samurai who are attacking a village. Um, and you have no idea what this is, why they would be doing this. Um, turns out if you go back and look at the history of Japan, uh, frequently villages uh, would hire uh, these little samurai uh, um, groups to attack other villages just to kind of drive them away to harass each other, really. Um, often um, it is in retaliation for something that the other village did. So if one village upstream you know, dumps trash into the river, th the one downriver will then send samurai up there to attack them. So that was probably a village spat that was going back and forth. Um, and I think that was there explicitly to, to remind people of the danger of war and conflict and that uh, you know, doing a, something bad to somebody, out, somebody else can then result in bad things being done back to you. The film also deals with social justice and its costs as well. We find out that Lady Eboshi has been buying up the contracts of every prostitute near and far, 
and she's been uh, bringing in lepers to help her with her work, um, which a very noble thing. Um, and then you discover that um, all of these ex-prostitutes living in Irontown have caught the attention of local people, and people kind of want to get in now. Um, a lot of the cat calls about the, uh, this town full of prostitutes. Um, that has effects on the rest of society. It, it, it makes Irontown a target. If she had just, you know, put out a call for people to come work for, work for her, um, there wouldn't be these people trying to get at Irontown. There wouldn't be that um, uh, uh, escalation towards war that we see later on in the movie. The movie also tackles um, technological progress and its costs as well. As we saw before, you know, Irontown is making all of these iron weapons and making rifles and making this, this increased technology. But by doing that, they've had to strip the, the nearby forest bare, um, which angers the forest spirits, but in general has just been a, a problem for the town. There are probably some interesting ecological things you can see in terms of the town itself, uh, you know, the mud streets and the fortifications and so forth and what that means. But I, I think more generally, Mononoke um, shows us how technolog technological process is costly. It requires a lot of time and effort and more technology to, to move forward. Uh, and the, <coughs> that causes issues with anything else you can do. It also makes you a bigger target. All right, I want to talk about some of the moments in uh, Princess Mononoke that really stood out to me. And the big one for me is the moment when San fights Lady Eboshi and then Ashitaka gets in the middle of that. Um, when I was involved in youth groups with my uh, church, I would frequently show the kids that scene and then ask them, um, what's the right thing to do in this situation? You know, was he right to stop that fight? Um, I particularly like it because it showcases the, um, the complexities of that situation where you have two people who are absolutely, they want to kill each other and they're ready to kill each other. Um, but somebody intervenes and stops that and you wonder, okay, is this just a, a delaying action? Um, but is that not a good thing to do anyway? Moreover, you see that by intervening, Ashitaka is making his curse worse. He's making things worse for himself, which is a very heroic thing to do, uh, but, but again, you have to count that cost, that these things aren't easy. Th um, stopping war, stopping other big things, it's complicated, it's hard, and it involves personal sacrifice. It's also interesting because we see how, up until this point, Lady Eboshi has a pretty good reputation in our minds. Um, you know, she's certainly severe, but she's rescuing all these prostitutes and these lepers, and she's providing a home for all these people, and she's a very successful person. But you see how small-minded she is, that um, she's kind of running over everything in her quest for her personal ideals. And there's that terrible moment later on in the film uh, with the, uh, the boars and when uh, they're about to go uh, to fight. And interestingly, it's not Ashitaka who's uh, dealing with them, it's San who's telling them to stop fighting. And there's that wonderful line that's just burned into my memory where the, uh, the, the head boar says, uh, um, look at my people, we grow small and we grow stupid. And you realize the import of that words, of those words, that it's over. You know, there's this decline to the end, and he'd rather go out fighting than uh, gasp and wheeze. Um, and that that's a horrible, horrible moment. And you realize why he's doing that. You understand where he is. That you know they're all going to just be meat eventually anyway. So it's better to at least stand up for what they believe in. Again, it's understandable, but at the same time you realize how horrible the results of that are. And then there is the Great Boar War, for lack of a better term, where we see them going in and fighting and dying and the explosions, just the intercutting between all of that um, emphasizes what's going on. Um, and I think it's important the fact that we cut back and forth between that and Ashitaka running towards the battlefield. Uh, if we had just had this big scene of them fighting, um, it would have felt big and heroic. Instead, it feels tragic because you can, you're, you're distanced from it in, in, uh, to, to an extent. 
you know, you know what's happening out there and you're running hoping you can get there in time. And of course, Ashitaka doesn't get there in time. Um, so by separating us from it, it actually drives the point uh, home even further. Brilliant. All right, let's talk about some of the characters. I'm um, starting with Ashitaka. And it's interesting here because our main character is noble-born, uh, a prince, quite literally, and he's uh, kind of the, the moral rock of the movie. Um, Miyazaki has talked about how he's kind of concerned about using royalty as protagonist, because that's such a, a cliche. Um, and it's kind of against his populist tendencies. Um, but importantly, that does give Achitaka a different perspective on things. Um, because he presumably was, um, you know, grew up with responsibility, and moreover with the need to think about lots of different people and, and the consequences of dealing with lots of people at once, uh, he's thinking at that higher level. Um, he, his purpose is to see with eyes unclouded by hate, which is something that um, uh, people in power generally have to do, um, or they're at least supposed to do. And I think it's important that he be someone like that who has that clarity to him. I also want to point out his sister, by the way. Um, I remember when Ashitaka leaves the, the, uh, uh, his village and the girl comes up to him that he kind of saved um, and uh, he says something along the lines of, um, um, I can never leave without saying goodbye to my sister. Here's an, an important note. Um, in Japanese, that's, um, of course, um, uh, the dimin a diminutive term. That's something that you say to somebody, not necessarily your relative, um, like you know, big bro or whatever, little, little sis. Um, and the point was that is intentionally meant to be vague. You're not supposed to know whether she's actually his sister or just somebody he really likes and has a pet name for. That might be his lover, for lack of a better word, or his you know, close childhood friend. Um, that's what he's leaving behind. She's not just a relative, she's someone very, very special to him. Which makes that ending where he, or that, that scene where he gives San that um, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, thing, it makes that very important. This, isn't just, this is not a memento from his family, he is transferring his relationship to San. And let's talk about San. Here's a character who is an antagonist, practically a villain for a good chunk of the film, who has completely prioritized nature over humanity and is a, a true savage, really. Um, and it's remarkable that Miyazaki manages to uh, make her likable, make her somebody that you actually do are interested in. Um, uh, and the fact that San is um, very slowly revealed to be somebody that Ashitaka cares for, First, you know, initially in, in more of a, um, uh, a general way. He sees this, this girl who has been raised by wolves, doesn't really belong there, and he kind of wants to rescue her. And then he starts feeling for and caring for her in more of a paternalistic or an older brother way. And you see he actually has like real feelings for her. And again, I think that's interesting and important that we have this character who is an antagonist, and the main character manages to turn into a, a protagonist. Let's talk about Lady Eboshi. Um, the more often I watch this movie, the more I sympathize with Lady Eboshi. Initially, I really you know, disliked her. Then I realized she's driven by a desire to help others. She's trying to build a society that is tolerant, um, you know, taking all of the disadvantaged people of, of, of society and building a little civilization out of that. Um, and she doesn't realize the importance of the natural resources that she's despoiling. She sees this as just some, something to... To, to make use of. And again, to her credit, at the very end, she's done. She says, okay, I learned my lesson, we'll rebuild, and we're not gonna go that, down that road anymore. Um, again, you have an antagonist who isn't a villain. She's not evil, she's not a Nazi. How nice. Now let's talk about Moro, the wolf goddess, who is curiously passive for a wolf. Um, granted, wolves in real life are more passive. Um, but she's kind of this dispassionate observer who's just watching all this go along. And she wants to protect her daughter, San, um, and can protect her territory. But otherwise, she sees all this going on and she's like, there's not much I can do at this point. Gotta let it happen. Then there's Okoto, the boar god. And getting back to that earlier point, it's intriguing to me that um, his way of saying, you're better to burn out than fade away, 
is presented as stupid. We should see it as kind of noble, but it's definitely presented as a bad idea. Probably because it kills so many boars, but still. Um, so is the film saying that it's better to just fade away and just become you know, meat to be hunted in the woods? Curious. I'm also intrigued by the apes for how little they are in the film. They present another facet of this whole problem. They have this middle way where they said, we're just going to replant the trees. We're just going to replant the trees. And the humans keep tearing it up and tearing it up. And eventually they get frustrated and, and just completely crazed by the fact that they can't, um, you know, their, their middle way is being so thwarted. Um, and, and you understand it. You know, these are the people who are trying to do the right thing, but even that's ineffective in this situation. It, it's, it's terrible and it's sad. And you see how they're driven to perversion um, in an attempt to, to, to do something. And finally, the monk, Jiko. Um, boy, you don't expect him to be a bad guy. I mean, early on, he's more the opportunistic guy. Um, although you do have that wonderful little line where he's drinking the soup, which hints to you that he's not that great of a guy. Um, but he turns into the, the one true villain of the piece. Oh, even he is driven more by... <coughs> more by... Um, more by a simple greed than anything else. He's doing what he thinks um, is the best thing for the kingdom and is the best thing for everyone involved. Um, you know, as far as he can tell, just pushing everyone further is going to stabilize the situation in its own way. He doesn't realize how bad it's going to get. Um, so certainly, um, certainly an antagonist, but again, not a Nazi. Refreshing. Of course, there's plenty more to talk about uh, with Princess Mononoke, but I'm just going to stop here at that point. Hopefully this gives you some things to think about. Um, feel free to add more in the comments below. Um, and as always, thanks for watching. Take care.